good evening, uh, uh, Roger, and uh, I want to thank everybody that's going to be listening on this interview with uh, Mr. Roger Cohen to discuss healthcare law and its intricacies for a provider, employee, and a patient. So just a little bit of a brief on uh, Mr. Cohen. He's a partner in Goodwin Healthcare Practice. He counsels healthcare services, life sciences, digital health, and investor clients concerning compliance with myriad laws and regulation governing the delivery of healthcare services, such as the anti-kickback statute, the physician self-referral law, the Stark law, the False Claim Act, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 HIPAA, Medicare, Medicaid rules, regulation, and laws governing reimbursement, licensure, and certification. The list is long. I'm not going to recite the whole uh, bio, but uh, we will have it on the link for everybody that wants it. But I want to touch that he is an expert in, uh, in management service organization MSOs or in dentistry, the DSOs, and in multiple things in helping people uh, create those kind of things. And so it's a, it's a, he's a man of a lot of uh, knowledge on all of the uh, thing related to healthcare. And that's why I wanted, uh, I have the privilege to have him. And I've met you, Roger, if you allow me to call you with your first name. Of course, uh, of course. Uh, as a student um, the, the, in the MBA and the Masters of Healthcare Leadership at Cornell. And I have to say, I was a little bit getting uh, disenchanted with the healthcare part of it. And you get it more exciting for me. And uh, I did use your uh, services also. So uh, I couldn't have asked for a better person to discuss this matter. So, uh, Roger, we've talked a lot about you and uh, shortly obviously we can go for a long time and you have a lot of experience in this but what struck me the most is when we met and you told me uh, something that still resonates I have a niche of a practice in healthcare and so for a lot of people don't know that there is a niche of healthcare law so would you please describe for us is there what's the difference and how does this apply Sure. Well, thank you first uh, for the very kind introduction um, and for having me on your podcast. I, I very much appreciate it and I'm excited to, to chat with you. Um, so, you know, why is, is healthcare law a niche area? Um, it's really a subspecialty of, of legal practice and it's a little bit unusual um, as a subspecialty. A lot of areas of like, legal subspecialty areas are focused on a particular area of law, um, corporate law or litigation or tax or employment. Um, and healthcare is really industry focused. Um, and it's a little bit unique in, in that regard, although more and more there are lawyers who focus on particular industries. Um, healthcare was maybe one of the earlier areas where lawyers focused on a particular industry. Um, and, and that's because healthcare is highly regulated and it's complicated. And there are a variety of laws that um, it, uh, healthcare providers have to comply with and they're complex. And, and over time, there are lawyers who started focusing or worked a lot with healthcare providers, dental practices, medical practices, hospitals, labs, et cetera, who developed expertise in, in sort of a, the kinds of laws that uh, healthcare providers have to deal with all the time relating to licensing um, uh, issues about who can own a dental practice or a medical practice, um, government approvals that are required to, um, to operate in, in the healthcare space. And then with Medicare and Medicaid, there are lots of complicated laws relating to healthcare fraud, the anti-kickback statute, the Stark law, healthcare privacy, HIPAA. Um, and, and so really healthcare law, healthcare lawyers um, have expertise in, in that body of, of law that, that impacts healthcare providers. That's actually uh, uh, interesting. I, I had the privilege to attend your lecture, so I, I got to understand them, especially when we talk about kickback uh, and uh, Stark law. Uh, so, Roger, just want to 
touch base on those two before we move to the other things. So the the anti kickback statue is it for every practice or only the practices that deal with Medicare and Medicaid? Sure. So the anti kickback statute is a federal law. Um, and it prohibits kickbacks for services that are paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, and, and other federal health care programs, TRICARE, um, as an example, also. Um, and so only practices that have reimbursement from government programs have to worry about compliance with the federal anti-kickback statute. But um, because health care law is complicated, um, most states have some version of their own anti-kickback statute as well. In some states, those laws are very broad, in New York, for example, and apply regardless of whether Medicaid is paying for the service or um, the private insurer is paying or, or a patient is paying out of pocket. And so you have to comply with, with those laws as, as well where they're applicable. Okay. And... Uh... And also the stock law, the, the stock law is also more for the federal than it is for. Uh, so, uh, sim similar um, to the anti-kickback statute, the Stark law is a federal law um, and it relates to services. So the, the Stark law prohibits what's known as self-referral, um, referring certain services um, when to an entity when you have a financial arrangement with that entity. So you're an owner of, of the entity or you're employed by the entity or an independent contractor for the entity, um, that can violate the, the Stark law. Um, and it only applies to services, certain services, and only when they're paid for by Medicare or Medicaid. Um, but like the anti-kickback statute, many states have their own versions of the Stark law that can apply more broadly, and, and New York has has its own version of the Stark law. Well, you couldn't have explained it better. So, since we are talking about that, uh, let's move to the field of dentistry that is really not that different than the medical. And in the medical, they we have seen consolidations and moving into the corporate into the, the, the medical practices they own by corporate. Dentistry is the same. Uh, so this is what's called management service organization, MSOs, and dentistry is called DSOs, a dental services organization. Uh, can you just explain briefly to the, to the dentist that they hear about the word DSO or even the patient, what does it mean exactly for them? Sure, so a, a DSO is a dental service organization and Dental service organizations are um, entities that are created um, to address limitations in who can own a dental practice. Um, so in, in many states, only a dentist can be an owner or a shareholder in, in a dental practice. And so if you want to raise capital to expand a, a dental practice, um, or if you want to invest in a dental practice and you're, you're not a dentist, um, in many states, you, you can't do that. Um, and, and for example, if you want to expand your practice and, and raise capital, you can't go sell a piece of your practice to someone who's not a dentist. And so it limits your ability to, to raise capital, um, to address those limitations. Um, many, um, entities form what's called a, a dental services organization, a DSO. Um, and that's an entity that can be owned by non-dentists. Um, and the DSO contracts with a dental practice or dental practices to provide services to the dental practice. Typically, it's a full suite of all the services that are necessary to operate the practice, except for the professional services that are provided by the dentist. The dental practice pays the DSO for, for the services, um, and you can have non-dentist investors in the DSO. Um, and, and DSOs have become very common um, for large dental practices that are um, opening up new new clinics um, and are want to have investors so so they can raise capital to open new clinics or to hire more more dentists 
um, they they typically use a DSO structure. Excellent. Uh, so basically, uh, a dental practice has to be owned by a dentist, and they end up working for the DSO, for instance, uh, indirectly. So, uh, yeah. So there's another thing that that we as dentists, you know, I uh, we don't do a lot is we don't have uh, agreements with our uh, people that work with us. So that's something that uh, still I surprised me how it is uh, widespread and especially uh, it's been a, a matter of fact that there's a lot of dentists now bring in specialists be it uh, periodontist or a surgeon, endodontist, whomever comes in and practice, uh, do their services in, in-house. This way they don't refer out. Uh, these are independent contractors, but is this, does the dentist who owns the practice, who is bringing these people in, should they have a, an agreement with these, uh, with these practitioners, with these specialists? So you don't need to have an agreement. It's not required by law that you have an agreement um, with uh, another dentist who's providing services uh, as part of the practice, is a, whether it's an independent contractor or an employee. Um, but agreements are very helpful <laughs> um, for, for a number of, of reasons. For one, they clarify you know, what are, what's the relationship What's the compensation un under the arrangement? Who's entitled to bill? What happens at the end of, of the agreement? Um, what are the party's rights? Um, often in a relationship like that, there can be tension around, well, who, you know, who gets to reach out to patients? What do you tell patients about if, if someone's leaving the practice? And agreements are very helpful for clarifying, clarifying those, those kinds of things. Um, and, and they help to, in, in, because they provide clarity, it helps to, pre to prevent disputes. You know what the, what the agreement is. Um, you, you hope you've written it down clearly. Um, and it, it helps to, to have a, a written record of what you decided, um, the arrangement is and, and to think through, think things through in advance and negotiate them instead of dealing that with them, um, down the line when it may be harder to resolve a, a dispute. Um, another helpful feature of having an agreement is um, a restrictive covenant um, or a non-compete. Often when you're bringing someone into a practice, um, you, you have a concern that they'll come work for you. They'll get to know patients. You'll bring them patients. They'll get to know the patients and you don't want them to leave and walk out with patients you, you brought to them. Um, and so non, a non-compete can be helpful there as well. And that's a common feature of an employment agreement as, as well. Um, maybe the final reason it's, it's good to have an, an agreement uh, with someone working for the practice is for compliance reasons. We talked about the anti-kickback statute and, and the Stark law. Um, and particularly if you have your practice has government reimbursement, um, Medicaid in, in particular, um, the agreement can can be helpful to ensure compliance with with the the anti kickback statute and the Stark law. And doesn't it also protect for the HIPAA because they are having access to patient data? Uh, ab ab absolutely. So for HIPAA, um, you don't need to have necessarily that. So one of the requirements on under HIPAA is that you have what's called a business associate agreement. Um, with if you have a contractor for, for a practice um, that's going to provide services um, and get access to patient information, the practice is subject to HIPAA, you need to have a business associate agreement that says what the uh, service provider can do with, with the patient information. They can only use it to, um, to provide the services and for certain other limited purposes. You don't need to have a business associate agreement with an employee. Um, and you don't don't necessarily need to have one with an independent contractor either, but you typically do want to ensure that an employee is going to agree to comply with HIPAA 
and your policies under under HIPAA or that an independent contractor will do the same. Okay, so uh, so that's that brings us to the patient's rights and privacy, and uh, this is like a big word and big buzz, and it's been from from nineteen ninety six, and it goes up and down, up and down. Uh, so, how can an organization navigate compliance with healthcare data protection laws? And that's uh, it's another big thing. Sure. So there's some basic things that are required to comply with with HIPAA, um, and maybe let's first start with you know who has to comply with with HIPAA. Um, not not everyone has to comply with HIPAA, um, but dental practices that bill insurers have to comply with HIPAA. If you don't bill, accept any insurance, um, or bill insurers, you're probably not subject to to HIPAA. Um, but if you do bill insurers you have to comply with HIPAA. And to do that, there are a couple boxes you need to check. You need to have what, what's called a notice of privacy practices that you provide to patients. Um, it tells patients what, how you use their, their personal information, their health information, um, to whom you will disclose it, what their rights are. And typically that's some, something you provide to a, a patient when they register with, with the practice, when they have an, an initial visit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have a website, you also need to have it on, on your website as well. Um, in addition, a practice needs to have HIPAA policies um, a, about how it can use patient information, um, to whom it'll disclose patient information, um, what it does to maintain the security of patient information. Um, a third requirement is to do what's called a risk assessment, um, which is really an exercise at in taking an inventory of the systems you use to store and process patient information, your electronic health record system, um, and, and your billing system, any other systems you, you may image it for imaging, um, other systems you may, you may use um, to store or process patient information, um, the risks to information that you process in those systems, and what you're doing to mitigate those risks, um, and putting that down on paper um, that's a third thing. Fourth piece is you need to have safeguards to protect the security and privacy of, of patient information. So patient information should be encrypted um, if you're storing it um, in your electronic health record system. That's generally the case for if you have a third party electronic health record provider, the information will be encrypted. Another area to be careful about is email um, and texting. Um, Regular email and SMS text messages are not encrypted, um, and there are limitations under HIPAA on emailing and texting with with patients. Um, patients have a right to uh, to um, opt in to email and text, and they can certainly email a practice. Um, but you want to be cautious about what you um, when you and you can respond to a patient that emails you. But even, even when that, that's the case, you wanna be cautious about the information you include because email's not secure. Someone else may have access to an account. You can send information to the wrong address very, very easily. Um, and so it's a good practice to limit any information you share in an email and, and not to, and you shouldn't, um, unless patients opt into it or reach out to you by email or text, you shouldn't text or email email them unless they've, they've done that. Very interesting, very interesting. So that brings me to, I mean, I'm gonna circle back into the employment law. I know you are not a, an employment lawyer, but you have information about these things because you know, in healthcare, there's more intricacies. Um, and I, 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 we spoke a little bit, but they, should they be in agreement between the, the the dentist and his employees uh is this something sure. needed so it's not required by law that you have an employment agreement with with an employee um and 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 often um what you do is you have an offer letter um instead of an employment agreement but employment agreements or or offer letters again are helpful as as we discussed earlier they clarify what, what the arrangement is between the employer and, and the employee. 
And particularly when you have a professional relationship, um, when you hire an associate, um, it's important to have cl clarity um, uh, around things like, you know, what happens when, when the dentist leaves, who, you know, who has the right yeah. to the, the patients, the patient information, what will the communication be? And you want to have clarity around that. And, and then as we discussed before, also, um, often you want to have a restrictive covenant. If you hire a, an associate, um, in a practice, um, you don't want them to be able to go open up a practice across the street and um, solicit your patients or try to take patients with, with them. Um, and so you want to have a non-compete and a non-solicit. Um, and you do that through an employment agreement as well. That's, uh, that's, that's great. And th does the hygienist have a restrictive covenant? That's, um, a, that's, a, that's an interesting thing that I wanted to... Yeah, you, you can. It, 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 is, it is permissible. Um, it's maybe a little a little less common, um, but it but can be a good a good idea. The, the dental hygienist often will have relationships with patients, and as a practice, you don't want to be in a position where your hygienist can leave and go to another practice and, and take the patient reach out, to, yeah. reach out to your patients. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting close to the end. There's only three more questions. Uh, thank you for indulging me with all of these. Uh, we we see a lot of times the transition of a provider uh, retiring, selling their practices to an entity or to another colleague. How should the let's say a provider who bought this practice or an entity bought that practice should they do uh, with that transition um, employment terms, uh, layoffs, restructuring? Is there any limitation on these things? Sure. So it's specific I'll, to healthcare or no? I'll I'll make a pitch here to work with a lawyer when when you're doing this. It's you know it's complicated <laughs> and and you know you can make mistakes um, if if you're not working with with a lawyer who has experience in in this area. Um, and there are a couple of key things to to think about. You know, one you want to review your your agreements. Um, and if you have a shareholder agreement for for the practice. Um, if there are multiple partners in 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 the practice, you want to understand what happens when you um, when a partner retires or you wind down. The, what what are everyone's rights? And usually there's an agreement that that specifies that, and and you want to understand that. Um, you want to look at your employment agreements as as well. You know, are you required to provide certain notice period to to your employees? Um, do you have a lease? You know, typically under a lease, you have a requirement to provide some notice to your landlord. Um, and, you know, um, you may be able to terminate your lease. Maybe, maybe you won't be mm -hmm. or transfer it. Maybe you'll need approval. Um, so all of these are important things to, to understand. You have to think about also patient records. Um, if you're winding down a practice, you have an obligation to maintain the records. And, and how are you going to what arrangements are you going to make? Um, to to do that, if you are selling the practice, um, you want to clarify what you know. What are the arrangements? On is the buyer going to maintain your records for you and and provide patients with access? Um, you also want to think about insurance. What what happens to your insurance if you wind down the practice, sell your practice? Do you have coverage? You know, particularly malpractice coverage, um, but but other kinds of of coverage that will continue after to protect you after you sell or wind down the practice and benefits issues as, as well. You want to understand what happens to your benefit plans, your health care coverage, um, and, and what your obligations are as well there. Yeah, and that's what they call the tailgate uh, insurance, uh, right? Yeah, exactly, that's tail uh, insurance. Yeah, oh, tailgate. <laughs> A more, that's yeah, a more a, fun kind uh, of tail insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been a long day for you and for me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, you you touched on this one about the transition. So, let's get to the last one: is disputes. You can have a dispute with a uh, with a, an employee, with a with an independent contractor, with an with the hygienist, with whomever. Uh, what would you suggest? 
for, sure. to avoid. I mean, I'm sure you said about it in the in the contract, but what is the easiest way to do that? So one, an ounce of you know, an ounce of prevention um, is is worth a pound of I I forget what it is. But having good agreements is is helpful, you know, because they help to avoid disputes. You you deal with issues up up front. You clarify what the everyone's rights and mm -hmm. obligations are, and that helps to avoid avoid a dispute. Um, not, but in in some cases, even if you have a very good and clear agreement, you can still wind up with with a dispute. Um, and uh, you know, again, helpful to consult with with a lawyer when when you have a dispute to understand the you know what's the contract. There may be laws that are come into play as as well, employment laws um, or or other other laws that that affect the party's rights that you want to think about. Um, and then, you know, it's very dependent on on the facts and, and circumstances. I think a lot of lawyers who who litigate and handle disputes will tell you, you know, you try. It's better to try and avoid a, a dispute to resolve a dispute if you can. Um, litigation can be very costly and time consuming and aggravating. Um, and so, you know, if you can if you can come to a res a reasonable resolution, that's often the best outcome for for everyone. And and often, if you have a resolution, you want to document that and have an agreement that reflects what, how how you're resolving the dispute, um, so that it doesn't lead to another dispute um, down the line as as well. Um, but there are, you know, sometimes you can't resolve a, a dispute, and and you do wind up in in litigation. Um, and you know, look there, you want to have experienced counsel to to represent you. Um, yeah. And and I think you want to carefully ass assess and go into it and understand. Well, you know, what's the timeline for? What's our strategy? What may you know? What what are our strengths and weaknesses? What's likely to happen? Um, what are the inflection points? You know, you want to go in prepared. Excellent. So, Roger, I believe we can spend hours talking. It's uh, so interesting to hear you. So I, I'm sure people know why I'm. I've been so. Uh, uh, impressed by you, and I I love talking to you and have you as a friend and as a uh, as a counsel if I need you. Uh, so I'm grateful for the time that you put with us and for the listeners or people watching it. And you need advice, he can be reached at two one two four five nine seven zero zero two. He is a lovely lovely gentleman to deal with. And uh, again, thank you so much for making the time. And I look forward uh, for our upcoming interviews with amazing experts in healthcare like Roger. And I wish you, Roger, uh, a wonderful Hanukkah and uh, for all of the listeners, a happy holiday season. Thank you very much for making the time, Roger. Thank you, Thanks. Ed Stengard. I appreciate your having me. Um, the feeling is, is mutual. Um, very much enjoy chatting with you always. Um, and I wish you the a happy holiday and a happy new year as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. For the next time. Bye. <laughs>